This episode of the Flush Podcast is brought to you by Federal Premium Ammunition, Benelli Shotguns, and Carlson's Choke Tubes, a shotgunning combination that we bring with us every day in the field. Today's guest is Darrell Smith. He's a young man that has a deep passion for the hunt, just like me. But Darrell's hunting journey looks a whole lot different than mine, simply because of the color of his skin. His story just might change you. Welcome to another episode of the Flush Podcast. My name is Travis Frank. I'm your host today, and I'm thankful to be joined by Darrell Smith. Darrell, Welcome to the show. What's going on, man? How are you? Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I I really appreciate taking the time to talk with us today. Um, just like so many Americans, I've spent the last several days doing a lot of watching and listening and praying and just really taking the time to consider how I treat people and how others treat people both intentionally and unintentionally and i can just tell you that i'm learning a lot how about you well i i i'm definitely learning a lot this is i'm sure by now everybody has either seen everything that's been out going on and and the thing that you said most important is praying okay um that there i think we should always keep that in the front of of our minds and i have you know i've 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 noticed that has been a constant theme in your life and it's a very very constant theme in my life as as well as my wife so um i i definitely think we need a lot of that you know going on right now and and i appreciate you you know opening and opening up with that as well yeah absolutely i mean the death of george floyd has had an effect on every single american uh, outside of America as well. That man should be alive today. There's no doubt about it. He's not. Mm -hmm. And instead we have really been given an opportunity that's really been there forever. We just haven't done it, but to talk to each other about this, to talk Mm -hmm. openly and freely and have these conversations. And it's horrible that it's taken another man losing his life the way he did being killed and now we have really over the last several several days made it a point to have these conversations i'm a white man you're a black man we both Mm -hmm. love to hunt and yet it's different for me than it is for you and Mm -hmm. i believe that's that's the reality right Right. That that is the reality that I think it's 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 one of those things that it beforehand and, and up to this point, really, it's either been seen and and not discussed, it kind of kept under swept under the rug, or it's not been seen and for a lot of folks doesn't seem real. I think that's been something that has been my biggest issue with with this, with everything going on, right? Um, mm-hmm. And I do, I, I'm sorry, I do not believe in coincidence. Who, you know, I've, I've obviously none of us have actually ever met George Floyd that I can think of, and whatever it was that triggered all of this is a signifier to me that that man, first of all, his spirit was huge. And 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 unfortunately, it set off a, a chain of events that have now um, set people into motion and 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 opened up the conversation for people to actually want to talk about you know and talk about solutions. You know, um, hunting has just been one of those things that you know obviously is very important to me. It's very important to you. And it's very important to everybody listening to that to that. And and I think that 
the thing that really got me is is there's so much advocacy for everything else in the hunting industry, right? Like we've got advocacy for conservation, we've got advocacy for advocacy for public lands for different birds. We've got all of this stuff, and that's powerful, you know, and it's very necessary. But are we advocating for ourselves, and are we advocating? for the people around us, you know, and, and advocating for better experiences for people that just quite frankly are, are going to have a hard time either getting into it, find a point, finding a point of contact or when you are into it, you know, feeling safe. Yeah. And, and that's something that just doesn't get discussed a lot. So I, 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 I just, I guess the, the can of worms popped open for me last week. <laughs> <laughs> well, we talked last week and I just, I remember talking to my wife and saying, my gosh, I just wish we would have recorded our conversation last week because it was, it was powerful. <laughs> and truthfully, I've been, I've been watching the news, social media, mm-hmm. my goodness, it is volatile. There's oh, so yeah. much on every side, but just the conversation that you and I had last week, mm-hmm. it was so refreshing. It's so refreshing yeah. because I just like, we're human beings, right? We're both yeah. human beings yeah. and we can care yeah. for each other. And I just, for the life of me, can't understand why human beings treat each other so differently because of the mm-hmm. color of our skin. I just, mm-hmm. I can't. And I do know this, that because of the world that we live in now and the platforms that people have and the amount of ways that we can be talked at and told how to feel, that there's so many um, people that push back from it. But like just our our simple conversation, two men Mm -hmm. sitting on the Mm -hmm. phone talking about life and, and not dodging the realities of the way you grew up and your life Mm -hmm. and the way I grew up in my life. I just think it's, um, my, my hope is that we can sort of, we're not going to relive our conversation from there, but I learned a lot about you and I feel like, um, if, if you're open to it, we just have this conversation right now and we talk about how, how I grew up and how you grew up and get Mm -hmm. your story because, you have your own story and we're not going to tell people what they need to think or feel or do, Mm -hmm. but I just want, I just want to tell your story. So are you, are you good with this? Should we do it? Man, We got to do it, man. Okay. (laughs) We we, we, we got to do it. We here. Yeah. All right. Okay. So Darrell, if you had to right now today, sum up in a sentence or two, what do you do in the hunting industry? All right. So in summation, what it is that I do in the hunting industry, number one, probably most notably, um, I run my podcast, the Gundog Notebook podcast. Um, And I have uh, since the beginning, been doing that since about 2017 um, and since partnered with um, Project Upland and, and, and AJ and Chet and all of those guys are whoops hold on i gotta can you hear me yep okay sorry my phone rang um so since um since i've started with my podcast i have um partnered with project upland and also had a lot of opportunities to to write and a lot of my writing has gone to various you know online publications in addition to um, in addition to um, print publications, um, like I said, most namely the Project Upland magazine. That's the most that's been the most recent. Um, mm-hmm. I've had some stuff written um, for the Orvis Hunting and Shooting blog. Um, that in the past I've had one for the Wild Rose Journal um, and a couple of other different things. But basically, I'm a writer. Um, I raise and train my own dogs. I've got my three-year-old lab. I've got my year and a half uh, old pointer. Um, and I am, you know, in the field trialing. 
Hopefully we do well. This is this will be Vegas, my pointer. This will be his derby season. Um, we ran him in a couple of trials last season, and he did well. We didn't place, but I was also running him above his age bracket. So I just like the competition. Um, I guide. <laughs> guide hunts for the Birds Club here in Atlanta. Um, and I'm going to start kind of taking on wild bird hunts um, on my own as well, guided hunts for that. And I am a sporting dog artist. So I, I, I've got my art career that kind of trickles into bird dogs as well. So a whole gamut of things. <laughs> <laughs> and you're a father and you're a teacher. And, and I'm a father. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I'm a father. So I, I teach middle school. I've got a nine month old and my wife's got one in the oven now. So yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I got a lot going on right now. You do, you do. Well, I've got three kids under the age of six. It's it's crazy, but it's oh, wonderful. Look, it's I'm, wonderful. I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be calling you about uh my, some some rough nights ahead. So <laughs> <laughs> please do. I will. Uh, you can cry on my shoulder. I've been there. I assure you, I've okay. been there. Where did so okay. you, you're very busy in the in the hunting world, but. This is all recent, right? You didn't grow up hunting. Take me back no. way when you were a kid. Did you hunt at all when you were a child? Um, I'm not going to call shooting squirrels with BB guns hunting. Mm -hmm. um, that is what my grandfather and I did. Just, I mean, we just, that's just, we would, we would, I would, he would teach me how to shoot. He was a, he, he was a postal inspector. Um, so I grew up around firearms and knew how to handle and stuff like that. And he taught me a lot of that. Um, but probably like a lot of kids, I, I was, you know, a force to be reckoned with, with a BB gun. And I, I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't do any kind of serious hunting. Um, I didn't have bird dogs growing up. Um, quite frankly, didn't know. The only thing I knew about any kind of hunting related dog, was hounds that's it i mean that it, you know um and i didn't really know a whole lot about that um and i i'm born and raised in atlanta and probably one of the few natives here me and my wife are probably one of the few actual natives in atlanta um in the city um and you know it, it was just something that like i went to private school my whole life and i, I, I told you this the other day but you know, I would see, I, I played sports, I played soccer and I, um, I ran track for the 400 meter hurdles. And I didn't, I never had a chance to really get out and like go hunting and I didn't know anything about it, but the school that I went to in high school and, um, some in middle school. So I went to Woodward Academy middle school and landmark Christian in high school. And in high school, I would see, you know, friends of mine, like during this one part of the year, right? Like it was one part of the year where they would start missing school for like whatever reason. Like I would come and I would, they just wouldn't be there. And they would come hunting back. Hunting season? Yeah, hunting season. <laughs> <laughs> right around November, they start missing school. And I was like, what in the world? Where are y'all going? And a, a lot of their fathers owned, you know, property. Um, I, I come to find out later that a, a buddy of mine, his dad actually owns a um, a hunting club down here. I would have never known, but they would be gone during hunting season and they would come back. I mean, just eyes wide open, had talk about they had the time of their life. Right. And that to me, I was like, well, dang, that seems real cool. Like I, I, I wish that I could do the same thing, but Again, there was no entry point. There was no connection. My dad, you know, he didn't hunt. My grandfather actually was more familiar with it because he's from Columbus, Georgia, but he wasn't hunting in either. And um, so can I ask you, can I ask you this? Sorry to interrupt, but why, yeah. why didn't you go? Why didn't you go with your friends? I didn't know how to ask. And I, I just didn't. You know, one of those things where you're a young black kid, you ask your parents to go to the woods, shoot guns, and do what with the stuff you come back with? You see what I'm saying? Like it, mm -hmm. that, that was, there was no way that I could have asked. And, you know, that wasn't, 
important. You know, that, you know, the list of things that I had to do to be able to go to college, you know, on my weekends, I was, I was in competitive sports. That was, you know, it was either that or academics that was going to, you know, kind of take priority and not knowing about hunting in a lot of our communities, it just seems like you, you just going out with a bunch of white guys to shoot stuff. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Like that, that's not mm-hmm, like a, mm-hmm. <laughs> And, and I, don't, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't know how to articulate why I was so interested in that. Because, again, as a kid, all we did in the backyard was just shoot at squirrels and periodically hit them. You know, that there's no and that's and, and, and we should never be doing it, first of all. Like, I, I don't care what what you're shooting at or what you're hunting. That's not OK. But just the reality of it, that's what we did as kids. Like, I mean, like little kids. And so. I, um, you know, I, I didn't know how to articulate that to my parents, nor did I, I, nor could I tell them where I was going, why, you know, there's just a lot of variables to, in a, you know, being, being inhibited from going out hunting and growing up doing that. Yeah. Well, I grew up going hunting with my buddies here, so it's, it's all I know. I guess I don't under stand why you wouldn't just say, Hey, I want to go with, or I want to try it. But you mentioned something the other day that was interesting, but it's just, that's not what black kids did. Yes. Like I said, we, you know, our, our way into, you know, the, 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 the next level of, of economic success is you go to college you do well in school. You see what I'm saying? You, you, you look for a scholarship um, or we were playing sports. I mean, all of the kids in my neighborhood, we were all talented. It was either. And, and I, I, I hate giving this narrative because I, a lot of the times it seems to, sometimes it comes off like that's all black people do. But and it's not. But you play football, you play basketball, you run track, you get a scholarship for it. You go to college. You get out of college, you find a good job, and you know you you you're, you you may have an opportunity to pursue something you're passionate about in your free time. But hunting, that's not on the list of priorities when your parents, you know, my parents, they 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 came from old Atlanta, you know, and it, and it was not as promising you know, as, as some other parts in the world. And so they were like, look, we can, we work this hard to keep you in private school. We need you to focus, do well in school and get out and, and go make something of yourself. Hunting wasn't like that. That That's not really on a list of priorities. You know, I mean, I I skateboarded back then, you know, around the city and things like that. But I mean, that's not that's just kind of something you do. It didn't take much to do that. I can go out and do that in the front yard, but hunting, (laughs) that's not, you know, that that's not like a, that's not a normal thing for folks that grow up, you know, in or around, you know, city environments and much less with, with a dog like that, that, that even takes it a step forward. You know, what, knowing what it takes to raise a bird dog, right? Like I've got a pointer, and that joker there is—he's a handful. <laughs> you know, my parents—they were like, you know, at, at most. I mean, my mom got me like little cocker spaniel stuff that you can keep around the house, but who has time to go and raise and train a bird dog? Not here. So, what changed then? What at what point of your life did you say I want to try hunting, and how did you get to that point? It changed when I got out of college and got on my own. I didn't have anybody telling me what to focus on. You see, like there, there was, there was. Okay, I, I'm, I'm out of, I'm out of college. Um, I'm making some, some money on my own. I got my own house. I got my own time. I'm not asking, you know, mom and dad, hey, you know, can I go here or can I go there? You know, it's it's the freedom of, okay, now I've got I've got time. I've got time on the weekends. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not competing 
competitively for something. I'm not trying to get a scholarship. I'm not trying to get out of 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 my parents' house. You know, I'm not. You know, there's all of these things, mm-hmm. and I, I had gotten into education. So to my grandfather, who I who is a father, my father father figure, like that. That was like, okay, you're doing good. You've done what we asked you to do. Now, whatever you want to do is on you. So at that point, I was like, all right, well, I need something else to take off of, of take my mind out of school. I also taught in a Title I school, which to anybody that's an ed- educator, like, that's a tough environment. It's a very tough. I was teaching sixth, seventh, and eighth grade art. I was the only art teacher there. And out of the many things that I would see on a normal day basis, you know, getting out and just walking out in the woods. I mean, I've always, you know, we, my family would go hiking, you know, like we, we've still got woods here in Atlanta. So I, I was used to playing outside. So getting back outside in the outdoors, now that I've got a job, I've got some stability. Now we can kind of go on, on out there. Mm-hmm. But before, you know, and our culture, I mean, it, you know, there, there's like a look, we need you to, to, to make it. <laughs> we need you to focus. And then when you get out and you are off of our watch, do what you want to do. And so I was like, all right, well, I got the time. Now let's um, let's go do something that I'd always been interested in. And I, and I remembered back to high school where I was like, dang, I always really wanted to try that. But mm-hmm. now we've got the issue of, well, where do I start? Because I, I like it still. It has always been in the back of my mind. Um, mm-hmm. And ironically, you know, I went to Albany State University. I was down in plantation country in college. And there were, looking back on it, there were, rem- there were like hints of it that would pop up. You know, but even in college, like I wasn't focused on that. I was focused on getting out of college and running track and keeping my scholarship, you know, for however long that I that I did, Um, because I I ran for three years and then I I jumped into my art career heavily. So the last year I didn't run. Um, So it was just a matter of priority. And, you know, being able to pay for a good dog. It took me a minute to even get to that point. But once I got into hunting, there were no images of, of, of black folks hunting that, that like that wasn't a thing. So now I'm, I've, 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 I've been interested in this predominantly white world. And I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to do this regardless. Like, I, I guess I'll just have to teach myself or whatever the case. And so I got online and looked up. Um, I knew there were clubs in hunting, so I, I looked up um, like black hunting clubs in Atlanta just to see. And there was one that popped up. There was one, and it was fairly new. Um, and a guy, the president of it, was is guy is a guy named Eric Morris, who was my mentor. Well, Eric, much like yourself, uh, I think he's from Alabama. He grew up hunting and stuff like that. But Eric has spent years trying to advocate for, you know, minorities getting into the hunting industry, but he was really the only one that was really trying to take on that initiative. So when I called him, I think he was like out of town or something like that. And he was just kind of getting the, 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 the club started in Atlanta. And we had emailed a couple of times. And then a few months later, he called me and was like, hey, we're going to have a club meeting. Well, we had the meeting at um, this place, Tom Low Trap and Skeet Range. And even that, like, I didn't know anything about trap shooting or skeet shooting or anything like that. So I pull up to the range. And ironically, this range is buried off kind of in the cut of the uh, the uh, the predominantly black side of town but you i would have never known like my wife and i had no idea that that was even over there and when we got there i pulled up and i noticed that the school that i used to go to woodward they actually had a trap and skeet shooting team 
that practiced at that range, but we never knew, like it was never communicated. So all of this stuff is kind of coming together. And I'm like, what in the world? Like, this is a whole new era, new avenue. So this wasn't there when you grew up then? I don't think I don't think it was there. And if it was okay. there, we never I don't think it was there. And if it was there, we never we didn't hear about it. Okay. Like I I did not hear about it. And I drove down that road 50 million times and that was never something that was advertised. So what and happened when you got there? When I got there, there's a bunch of white guys there. And and you know, they're cool. They're they're like, hey, you know, how can we help you? So on and so forth. And Eric is in he he's booked a room in a lodge. And I think there was a handful of us that were in the room. It was it, it was mostly guys. Um, I don't think women, I don't remember seeing any women there until a little bit later. And Eric was basically like, you know, this is how you get into hunting and I'll show you how to do it. At that point, I was like, OK, we're in. And I gravitated towards Eric um, and he took me out. Um, yeah, you know, he taught me about different kinds of shotguns. He taught me about how to how to hunt different types of game. We would go squirrel hunting and yeah, like proper squirrel hunting. Um, we went deer hunting a couple of times. And, and I think that was my, my other point. I was like, I don't really like sitting in trees. Um, I don't really like the waiting game. Um, and so it took me a while to filter out what it was that I wanted to do and wanted to see. And even in that, I still didn't have the, the enthusiasm about deer hunting that so many people do, which I just didn't connect to it. Um, and so I knew by this point in time, I used, I, I've had a number of pit bulls over the course of my life. And the last one that I had, I ended up having to rehome her. Um, she got real aggressive and I, I just started dating my wife and, um, and that, that wasn't going to work. <laughs> like <laughs> I, that wasn't going to work. Um, right. and, and so I ended up having to rehome her. Well, I ended up saying, okay, I want a dog. And, and I had this, um, I didn't know really what I wanted to do. So Eric took me out quail hunting. But it, it was it was preserved birds. It wasn't like wild quail. I still had no idea what this was. And I had my shotgun and all of that stuff. And I mean, he, he's got this really this nice size Chesapeake Bay Retriever, which is not the usual <laughs> quail dog that you would. Right. Think of. <laughs> That's it, not it what you think wasn't. of. Right. It, it, right. But I mean, this dog worked his butt off. I mean, worked his butt and we hunted all day. I'd never, I, to this day, I've never seen a dog like that hunt all day as hard as he did. Um, but then, you know, we would take Razor out and he, he could go track deer for Eric. You know, he was telling me all of this stuff and we would see it. He could go, you know, retrieve squirrels. He was just an all around dog. And I was like, dang. And Eric started telling me more about African-American history and how we would have to be creative with the use of our dogs. And I was like, this is kind of cool. So then I did a little bit more online searching and I was like, I'm going to get me a Labrador. I want a dog. My wife was cool. Well, my, she was my girlfriend at the time, but, um, y you know, I, I told her, I was like, I think I'm going to get me another dog. And, 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 um, I went and got a Labrador. Ruger, my lab now. And, you know, Eric, Eric, is, he is not the a dog trainer. He just got a good dog and, and they hunt and he spent a lot of time together. But I was like, all right, well, I used to train my pit bulls to, to do all kinds of cool stuff. I'm going to train this dog by myself to the to still no connection to anything bird dog related, like no connection. And I'm going out to places and, you know, kind of like, I'm still the only black guy there with a, so lab, Eric a is, young lad. Can I ask, Eric is yeah. the, he's the one that started this club, right? But yep. you said he grew up hunting. So he's, he's a white man. Is that correct? No, Eric is black. He's one of the few oh. black guys here in Atlanta. He okay. moved here. Like Eric traveled. He was in the military for the longest time. 
Um, and after he retired, he had, because his, his, his experience is one of the few that were here in the city that actually grew up hunting, but none of us knew about him. I mean, he had been trying to make connections for years, you know, and, and slowly the club started picking up. Um, but I didn't know Eric until I went online and just so happened to find the one person in the whole city of Atlanta that was actually trying to advocate for that. Um, and Eric still was on the other side of town. <laughs> so I still had to go to him. Um, you know, and he was doing all kinds of stuff. So he, so I got my lab and I ended up going to some of these, these, you know, hunting clubs and things like that. Um, I would, I would, I, by now, by then I was starting to hear about, you know, Ducks Unlimited and things like that. Um, and again, it was because of Eric that I even found out about Ducks Unlimited and we would go to these, you know, DU chapter meetings and we were the only guys that the only black guys there. What and did, uh, time, how, how did you feel when you'd walk in there? Um, it's, it's, it's different. Um, you, you just know to, like it's the obvious feeling of, am I here? Like, am I? I, I don't really feel like I'm supposed to be here. Um, it, it, you just notice that you stand out. You know, it it wasn't till later that I started getting kind of some some negative comments, and it didn't come from DU. It came from some other people. I'll tell you about that too, but. I mean, it's kind of, you're, it's nervous. Like you walk into this, you know, either at somebody's house or, or to some uh, club or something like that. And you just stand out, you know, and, and you, you don't really know a lot. So you don't really have a voice either. You know, you're coming in to learn. Um, and I, I just didn't feel a connection. Like I was just like, ah. Uh, you know, what am I doing here? Um, and it took you, a while. How, hmm? I was going to say, how do you convince yourself to just keep on going? That's the thing. So you realize that, all right, if I, if I stop going because I'm starting to feel out of place, if I mm -hmm. stop going, then I'm giving up on something that I'm interested in. But if I keep going, how far down the rabbit hole am I going to be before, like most other things in the South or in America, really, you, you, you be black long enough in something, you're going to hear or see something that is going to bother you or something that's going to make you uncomfortable. And it's kind of like, all right, well, at least if I don't connect with these guys, you know, I've got one one buddy that's in it. I guess I'll just try to work on his schedule and go hunting with him. You know, and so it's and, and the one thing is you just don't want to give up on something you're interested in. And I think that's the thing that I've always tried to keep in the back of my mind. Like, look, regardless. Use it as an experience and move forward. If you got to learn on your own, you just got to learn on your own. Um, like I said, it, it, there was still no, no connection. And there's been a couple of times where I would go out and I would, I would kind of, you kind of see people like talking to each other under their breath and you kind of know they're kind of looking at you like, who is this guy? Um, and you start to bring your dogs around and there, there's this other pressure about that too. Because now you're the you're the only person in this particular industry um, that that's a minority, and this boy better not bring this dog up here and mess up our hunt. You see what I'm saying? And so there's that pressure of, oh shoot, you know, I've always felt the pressure of my dog needs to be up to par. Um, but I just never connected with any of these major organizations 
that I had been a part of up to that point because there was nobody there that looked like me. Hmm. And so, I mean, I knew I was never going to be a chapter president if I was interested in that. I knew that wasn't on the books. Really? Um, you don't think you can? Men, no. Um, that's not... That is, that's not something that I ever saw as, as, as like an opportunity. I mean, I know I could be involved, um, but I I didn't, I didn't see anybody. I I just knew that, okay, yeah, you're welcome here and we, we, you're, you're welcome to participate in things like that. But I didn't feel like I was ever, because I didn't connect to them. So what was I going to say? So a lot of people listening right now might say, gosh, uh, that was a long time ago. You know, it's different today. No, th- you're telling us a story from two years ago, aren't you? Last year, the yeah, year before? This is, this, so we're thinking, yeah, 2018. By, the, by 2018, this had kind of started rolling around. Because yeah, you've only so been hunting. This this all started in, you haven't, you haven't had a dog I, I, for four years, right? Mm-mm. I got my dog. I got Ruger August of 2016. August of 2016 is when I got him. Um, I didn't really get into like actually starting to hunt until 2017. I had him. I've been training him for the latter part of the year, kind of taking him out and trying to figure my way out. But I wouldn't say I got my feet up under me until 2017. So that's about three years. Okay. Um, three you, years ago, and then I didn't get my. Go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, do you think you you would have been able to do it without Eric? Um, I would have fumbled around for a very long time, a very, very, very long time, because Eric was the thing that when I went out, I knew that if I I, I knew I wasn't by myself. You see what I'm saying? And I and that was something that mm-hmm. helped my argument when I was going out and telling my wife I wanted to hunt. Again, we were dating at the time. But you get mm-hmm. the look of, so you're about to go out to the woods by yourself with a bunch of white guys and guns. Huh. Georgia is also very, is, is known, obviously, Ahmaud Arbery and stuff like, there are still cases like that <laughs> that still pop up in South Georgia. So. Cases, you know, explain that though. Explain just because it, well, that I mean, there, like, exp- all right. So the, the Ahmad Arbery case in relation mm-hmm. to being black, just in America, really, but especially in the South, that is not something that is unheard of. Ahmad Arbery, that case, that case went on for what, like two months and nobody even heard about it until it, the, the video leaked. And it was very obvious and very blatant. It is very well known that there are still instances of racism down here and people that will actually do something. You're in the backwoods of Georgia, you know, chasing deer, chasing birds, whatever the case may be. And you very well could come across somebody that, and I mean, from the moment that you leave your house, you could very well come across somebody that does not want you there. And I have met people that have told me, you, we, you know, you, you th- this ain't really your ballpark. And, you know, cases like the Arbery case, I mean, think about it. Those folks hunted him down. Like they literally chased that man as he was dry, uh, jogging, got out and killed him. That is not an unfamiliar thing. My grandfather would tell me stories in the, in the inspection service of, folks being in a KKK. You see what I'm saying? And, and trying yeah. to intimidate him. So I've all, we've always, as a black person here, you always grow up knowing that like, don't go to the woods because you could show up, you know, missing, you know, or don't go to the woods by yourself unless you know somebody that is very, very experienced for the same reason, or just for the simple fact of, you know, uh, if I put my, my shotgun in the truck and I, I, I'm a legal card carrying, you know, firearms owner, I, 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 I have a pistol. 
that I'm legally obligated, you know, allowed to mm-hmm. keep in yep. my car and stuff like that. Stuff like that still happens where, okay, cop or somebody, I get pulled over for whatever reason for being in the wrong side of town and I stand out and you get pulled over literally for being black and they see a, a firearm. It doesn't matter whether it's locked up or, or, or not. So that you have camouflage you. or hunting. Or that I have, with. Yeah. I, it, none of that matters. <laughs> People don't ask you those questions. And so I could go out, be my, out of my own business, going hunting, cop gets intimidated by God knows what or or scared, who knows. I end up, you know, something ends up happening to me. And it's very easy to say, oh, well, he pulled a gun on me. No, I didn't. You see what I'm saying? Like those yep, types of yep, questions don't, you know, those those types of questions don't ask. So to 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 go hunting, you know, by yourself, like you know, I, I wanted to go coon hunting and stuff like that, you know, when I first started and my wife was adamantly against that. And I, why? you know, understood why coon why? Hunting, you have to go out at night, you know, like you go out at night. I didn't know anybody. Mm-hmm. So I was very likely going to have to find somebody that did it. I didn't know any black people that coon hunted. None. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, and, and so what, go out with a bunch of white guys that, you know, live out in the back country at three o'clock in the morning to chase a raccoon. You try to explain that to anybody and on this side of the community and you're going to get some eyes raised. Like, so you going to do what? Hmm. Did you do it then? Okay. Did you go? I went once with Eric. <laughs> I went once with Eric. <laughs> And he and I both that like that was the only reason why I could go. And we never found anything, but I never went with anybody else because I it it, it didn't feel safe. It just didn't. How how you far know, do um, you how far do you have to drive to where you you can hunt? And is it it's a public land that you can hunt on or that you hunt yeah, on down there so mainly down, or? Okay. Down here, it's it's public land. Um, so if you want to like get into deer hunting, um, and this was something we didn't know about here either, you can actually archery hunt right outside of the city limits of Fulton County, which is the county I li- I grew up in. Um, you go, but to get to actual decent hunting. You're probably going to drive anywhere from two hours and a normal drive for me is about four to get down to South Georgia. So from Atlanta to Thomasville is four hours. Um, And so I will if I and and some of my other places, I go to South Alabama. um, That's three hours. So, I mean, you're talking about getting up at two o'clock in the morning to be at the place where I go to be there by sunrise in the middle of the woods. I don't have service. There are a lot of potholes in that, you know, (laughs) in that. You mentioned to me, I mean, there's a couple things that you told me the other day that really stood out to me. Um, And I've, I've really just been sitting on them a lot because I can't, I can't uh, say that I've ever been in a position like it is one when you're driving, to your hunting location, you're mm-hmm. nervous or a bit scared the entire way there because you have shotguns in your vehicle. And right. two, that you tell your wife exactly where you're going to go. You give her mm-hmm. GPS coordinates and you don't go anywhere else because you want to make sure that she knows where you're going to be right. because there are black men that disappear in the woods. Right. And they're black. And even, even outside of the woods, I mean, as we've seen it, like you can get killed in the middle of the street and somebody be recording it. So it's everywhere really. But Mm -hmm. yes, I, so the, the routine that we have, my wife knows all of my, you know, um, 
hunting coordinates. <laughs> she is. I might as well sign her up for my Onyx map stuff. Like, you know, she, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, she knows all about. We, we laugh. We laugh at that, but that's not something that we should we should ever mm -hmm. laugh at. Like, I just can't. I can't wrap my head around that. Yeah, I mean, it's that's this that's the way to be safe. I mean, it just is. Um, there are in in this community, unfortunately, there are people that do not want or 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 choose to not see the 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 issue at hand. And so, and there are people that that resist minority, you know, participation. And historically, that has been happening. That's a whole another thing. But the routine, I tell my wife, you know, what time I'm leaving the house because she's normally sleep. Um, where I'm going, usually how long it takes for me to get there, um, because I know these places are usually not going to have a signal. I generally call her when I get to the place. Hey, I'm here. I'm good. And if I decide to or I'm sorry, when I take a break about midday, I go back to the signal area. Hey, we good. You know, and, and what time I plan on leaving to come back home um, at that point, if I decide to change locations, um, I, of course, have to tell her, hey, look, this is where I'm going. Um, and that's because now I, I'm because I know what I'm doing. Um, I know how to kind of navigate stuff. I know where I'm going and I, I kind of know the general area. And I usually try to hunt around the same areas. Um, you know, and I don't really go with a lot of new people. I go with people that I've, I've met in of, of any race, but I go with people I've met and I've been afforded, you know, that privilege because of some of the stuff that I've done through my platform. But, you know, Two years ago, I mean that that going hunting by yourself that wasn't that wasn't a thing. <laughs> like wow. that was not a thing. And there and 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 again, there are issues with even some of the ways that people get land access. So I'm not. I hear I hear stories about guys like, oh yeah, man, like go up and, and knock on this person's door. And, and, and if it's private, ask if you can hunt that land. Who do you know black that's going to do that down here? No one. Like that's, I'm not about to, to walk up to somebody's door, knock, just random black guy, knock on your door and say, Hey, uh, can I walk your property with a gun? Chasing birds, and there and there are some people that will understand that. Like we are obviously in a much better place in 2020 than than so long ago. But there are still people that are like, "Who are you, and why are you here?" If I can't be in a in a in a in a, 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 a white neighborhood, even here in Atlanta, and not get funny looks, I might just be jogging. I could be driving through, whatever the case may be. You will get the, sometimes like there have been instances where people have called the cops. I knew like just being in the neighborhood. Oh, no, just being I've had my own, yeah, just being in there. And I and I've, I've literally just my own personal recollection. I got pulled over by a cop um, down here is a city called Fairburn. When I was 17 years old um, driving and this has nothing to do with hunting, but just to kind of give you the idea of getting pulled over by when you're when just for being there. Right. So yep. I was, I had my brother we went to private school. We got a whole uniform on and so on and so forth. It is very clear where we are going. I woke up late, me and my brother in the car. My brother is five years older, five years younger than me. So I was 12 years old. I'm sorry. He was 12 years old. And I was, I was 17 at the time. I'm driving, taking them to school, and we are, I'm speeding probably about five miles over the speed limit. Sit, not doing anything, not swerving. It's like eight o'clock in the morning. So I get pulled over by a white cop. And usually, if there's an issue, especially with speeding, you just get a ticket and you're going about your way, especially if I'm on the way to school. And the school was very well known um, in that area. It's a very prominent private school. By the end of that interaction, I was in handcuffs and the cop said that there was no 
uh, well, his excuse was there was no um, insurance on my car, which is BS because I was I, my dad had insurance. My dad worked a very 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 good job. Like we're not we 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 just don't drive around without insurance. I'm in handcuffs. They're you know trying to obviously tow my car and stuff. They're 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 getting all of that stuff situated. And there's this one white cop, mind you. I've still got a. 12 year old little boy in my passenger seat that still got to go to school and we're right down the street so back then we had flip phones i'm texting my dad from behind my back um you know to say hey this is what's happening this is what's going on my brother is watching me get arrested and so now i'm like and he's like well get in the car get in the car the the cop is and that puts me in a weird kind of position because now you're forcing me to have to make a decision on to object to what you're saying because you're going to leave my 12 year old brother out here in the middle of the road and somewhere he is not familiar with. You see what I'm saying? You see what kind of position that, that puts me in at 17 years old? Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, can you, so, can you give more details on that though? Like what, what specifically was he asking you to do? He was asking me to get in the car so he could take me to jail. For, for what? For nothing. I had insurance on the car. He lied and said I didn't have insurance just to put me in handcuffs and put me in jail. My brother is sitting on the side of the road crying, like bawling. And I sat there and told him I'm not getting into the car, at least if somebody comes and gets my brother and takes him to school. There was insurance on the car. He had no reason to to put me in handcuffs for even what I was doing wrong, which was just speeding a couple of miles over the speed limit. That's right. a ticket. That is not jail time. You see what I'm saying? Like that's yeah. that's not, you know, you don't do that. And so he ends up calling another cop and puts my brother in that cop car to try to make a point and drops my brother off at school. So my 12 year old brother gets dropped off at a private school, a predominantly white private school. He gets dropped off in a cop car. What image does that show you? You see what I'm saying? Meanwhile, I'm getting taken to jail and I miss half a day of school for what? nothing and when i got to the jail there's a black clerk there and she was like baby you know what this is like you were not supposed to come to jail you already know what this is and so things like that happen on the mm-hmm. on the regular you don't time it you don't do anything you, it just happens and of course i have to go to court for it and the judge drops it because there were, i shouldn't have been locked up and there was right. no way to justify it there was no way to justify that and I worry like ever since then, I worry about, okay, so what happens if I'm driving to a hunting spot? Like I said, I've got guns in the car. I've got, so now if I get arrested, you're going to leave my dogs on the back of the truck. My truck going to get impounded. Like what you see what I'm saying? There's, there's a chain of of events that go on with that. There's so you you, you can never, you can never go hunting without having worry follow you into the field the place where you want to go to escape the place that i mean for me personally it's one of my mental escapes to just walk the field be carefree and you're out there on the way there you're worried when you're in the woods you're 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 afraid (laughs) there's 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 that you don't get away from that thought and that 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 fear that that's like okay Hmm. know know where you are you know so why do you do you suppose do you suppose this is why there are so few black hunters then yeah absolutely i think there there's that um you know when we think let's just go back in history right let's let's take some decades back all right after jim crow ended like because the, the 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 majority of black folks that were hunting primarily were in the South. Okay. They were down here in the South. Mm -hmm. Well, after Jim Crow and slavery and all of that stuff ended, black folk got out of here. They headed North. 
and went to the cities. You see what I'm saying? To get yep. away from all of this. This was something that we were used to doing in the, the earliest days of, of hunting. Those of us that are still down here are are the descendants of, you know, like Neil and my all my buddies, they're the descendants of guys that, that worked on the plantations and that stuff got passed down. But predominantly, Black folks left the South to get away from all of this stuff. And so historically, that narrative has been passed down like, you know, hunting has its negative connotations. It has its its connotations with, you know, very, very racist people. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and there's there has been some truth to that just over time. And so you've got that. There are no representatives in it. I mean, like I said, it took me a while to find Eric. And then I haven't even gotten to, to finding Neil and all of those guys. So the, the other issue is we're out there, but we're scattered. You know, you, you, you look anywhere for, you know, what do you see in most, most, or, and, and when I, when I was teaching, right. Or not when I was teaching, when I was teaching um, for a title one school, like most kids, they wanted to grow up to be athletes. Most of them. Why? Because that's what they saw. We're very, very talented at sports. Usually that's a means of, of, of getting through college, having the money to pay for it. And I see people in it that look like me. Mm-hmm. Well, with hunting, I don't know any, any you know, African-American icons that just, that are just prevalent. You know, there is, you know, one one guy that I really, really like to look at is Stephen Ronella. Like, I love his podcast and everything like that. Where yeah. are any black Stephen Ronellas? Right. <laughs> right. There are none. So, well, I think I'm talking is- to one right now. I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I seriously. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, you're, I, I, you're I take 100... that as a compliment. But... <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, this this is a reality, right? It's it's not like yeah. I could I could go find hundreds or thousands of people to interview today, tomorrow, the next day, but this is a topic that we got to talk about because yeah. I can't I can't find hundreds of Darrell Smiths out there that are pushing <laughs> through this barrier. To do something that we all take for granted, right? Yeah. yeah. Because I well, mean, it, last it, week when we talked, when we were talking last week, you, the 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 you say plantation, which is where a lot of the hunting oh. happens in the South, right? Mm-hmm. And you instinctively want to run as far away from it as possible, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. The moment that. When I got into this and 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 started meeting um, my buddies from the uh, Georgia Florida Shooting Dog Handlers Club, like when I started going down there and and actually stepped foot on plantations, and the first matter of fact, the um, my dog's first hunt test, my lab, the first and only hunt test I, I ever ran them in. I just wasn't really into it after that. I mean, it was fun, but the very first hunt test that I went to was on a plantation. And I think the the the, the image and, and the history of plantations has been so far embedded in fear and the in, in the black community and rightfully so. I mean we all know what happened there. And so I, I think there has there has been an ingrained fear of it. So you know, my wife and I were driving to this place. It looks like, I mean, it it looks like um, Roots, you know, the movie, like that 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 type of situation, the, the, the overhanging trees and a long driveway and all of that stuff. And it's beautiful, but it's still kind of haunting, right? Like it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's everything that I appreciate about Georgia and plantation country, right? That I can appreciate now knowing and, and being welcome to these places. But when you are a stranger in a in a very very unfamiliar place, that is a very haunting um, thing. You know, it's it's like okay. And even my wife was like, "Oh, this is where we going." All right. So when it start getting dark, 
we need to head on out. You know, and 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 when you get there, some places you know that they were the the old slave quarters. They're probably either unused or renovated at this point. But you, I mean, you know what when you see it. Um, there, it, there is just that 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 energy that still kind of looms over it. So, you know, a lot of black folks, and, and I and I've had this conversation. My, my wife does a. We talk about this a lot because she's she is like an editor for me. <laughs> she is my editor more or less. Like, and and I'm writing about some of this stuff, and she's just like, hold on, like you need to think about what you're writing and how it and and and, and what you're saying because to the black community you're going to get side eyes about going to plantations and the use and 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 being there so you need to be careful about the way that you word it you know because in 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 one hand it's like you want to I want to to celebrate the the, the plantations now because of field trials that they're held on, you know, things like that. But, you know, in our community, it's just like, so scratch all of that. What are you doing on a plantation? At the end of the day, like that, like my grandfather, like when he, when I told him that he, you know, he's, he's, he grew up in the time of civil rights. Like you went to where? And I'm, and I, and, and I start to have to try to explain that in a way that tells the narrative now without disregarding what happened in the past, because that is still a very, very prevalent thing. At no point can I ever be like, oh, well, they're great, you know, and it's, 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 it's awesome now, but at no point am I going to be able to um, forget or dismiss the image that they they present themselves way back in the day. I'm always conscious of that. Does your family support your your passion now in going now, out to yeah. the okay. <laughs> Yeah. So I it was it was a jump. I mean it was a challenge, you know, for, for my folks to be like, so you're going to do this? All right. How is that gonna work? <laughs> um my granddad has always been very, very supportive of me anyway. He's just always like, look, man, just just be careful, you know, just just be careful in, in how you go about doing things, because at the end of the day, you still black. <laughs> like, don't forget that now. You know, when you um, show up, when you show up on a plantation with other people to hunt. Is it just one of those things where you don't talk about it? You're a black man walking around there um, doing the same thing everyone else is doing. You just don't talk about it. Everyone knows it. Or do you feel like you can have that conversation? The first time. I, all right. So I've actually had some unique. Uh, very, I'll, I'll give you one unique experience. I, I might have mentioned this to you last week. But all right. Usually it, it's something that is unsaid. So I went to one plantation here. I was the only black guy. I knew it. I felt it. It was, um, you know, an organization's banquet. I knew it and I felt it. I knew everything about that was off. All right. That was the first time. And I didn't need to talk about it. Um, I just didn't feel good about it. All right. So the second time I'd gone to, um, a different plantation. So this was the, that hunt test that my dog was running, my lab. It was actually very interesting. It was a white guy that came up to me. Um, his name was Gary. It was a white guy that walked, came up to me and was like, hey, man, like I, I, I'm sitting by the truck and uh, my wife and I are talking and he was like, hey, can I talk to you for a second? And I was like, yeah, what's up? You know, I just cool. No problem. And he's like, I want to thank you. What are you thanking me for? Like, you're not thanking me for my dog passing a test. <laughs> like, what are you thanking me for? And um, he's like, I want to thank you for showing up. He was like, and and this really resonated with me. And this is how I know that we are in a space where we can have these dialogues. He says, Well, I want to thank you for showing up because 
you're the only black guy that's ever come out here. And I don't know if anybody else is going to say it. It's obvious. It, we, you know, we all know it. We see it. But I personally want to thank you because we need more of you here. And I'd never experienced that before, like being out in the hunting industry, like nobody had said that to me before. It was an older white guy. And I was like, whoa, hold on. And I just appreciated the boldness that came with that, you know? And right. that was the thing that really made me feel a little more confident about going to some of these places. Because that, that gentleman, Gary, was like, no, let's just be straight up. You are out of place. You are, <laughs> you are, 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 you stand out like a sore thumb here. But thank you for taking the initiative and, and showing up despite what I know this mic can feel like. My wife heard it, everybody, and, and I was like, okay, cool. All right. Well, see, like, I see I, a lot of people would avoid, they would just, it's more comfortable to not talk about it. It's and it's that is uncomfortable. The issue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's the, the tough part. Because look at what yeah. one person who is willing to just stand up and say, Thank you for being here. What that does for you. I it, it's stuck with you, it sticks with you, it yeah, encourages I will, you. I will to... never forget that. Well, I I'm mean, so thankful I, I, for I, Gary I, then. <laughs> I'm so yeah, thankful for Gary. Seriously. I um I I I you know it um that stuck with me. And so now you know, I've got buddies, my, my good buddy, Terry um, Chastain, I, I'm, I, I, you know, I, Terry has been super integral, you know, just a, a dang good friend. Um, Terry's a white guy. And that, see, that, that conversation is different because we're friends and we met on a, at, at the Black Handlers trial uh, in 2019, the, after the, the this the year that we filmed the project Upland Hard Day Riding film is the year that I met um at that same trial that I met Terry. And Terry and his father um grew up with black dog handlers and they're from Thomasville though. Like they're from down there. And so I was sitting Terry had broken his leg so he wasn't riding a horse that day. And I I just I think that's you know, we were supposed to meet each other that day. And so you know, when all of this stuff um, started popping up with all of this George Floyd stuff and all of that, you know, Terry and I spoke. Terry has loaned me his horse. You know, um, Terry has just been super open. He's invited me down to, to come, you know, work dogs with him down where he works at now. Um, and he is one of the, the, the few white guys that I know of that we have an open dialogue about the issues at hand, you know? And Terry is just like, he's, I, I'd rather you keep it real. Like, look, this is the issue. This is something we don't see very much. Let's talk about it. Kind of like what we're, I mean, much like what we're doing now. Yeah. Terry has been like, man, I, I get it. You know, I, I get it. I see it. Um, fortunately, he was, he grew up, his dad was a great, dog trainer so he grew up with other black handlers and so though he never you know uh perpetuated stereotypes and stuff like that Terry's also been real he was like man I know plenty of people that will either shy away from it or just you know act like it doesn't affect them and that's just the real conversation that we have you know between us two Mm -hmm. Um, and it takes a while to build up that kind of relationship with folks. It does. Yeah. Um, I'm not, I'm, I, I just, you know, half the time when I go out hunting, I hunt with, like I said, I hunt with friends, but you know, I'm not really itching to have the, the, oh, you're black conversation <laughs> when I already know. Yes, I'm I'm out of place. Like that's usually not something I'm I'm really trying to bring up. But when you have that connection to people, you know, it 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 makes me feel a lot better to be honest and upfront. It lets me know that there are people that are actually willing to do something to change the narrative. 
And it lets me know also that, look, we can be real. This is an obvious thing. You know, it it just is. Right. Um, I think once you get into the field, I mean, I think by nature, those of us that seek the outdoors and the hunting or the fishing, but just really seeking to get away in the outdoors, we do it to get away from mm -hmm. all of the the news and, and, and work life and just being able to disconnect for a little bit. And so I feel like maybe, maybe we, we avoid these kind of conversations because by nature, we just want to avoid conversations in general, but you spend a day out in a field with somebody like mm -hmm. if you and I, we, we, I, I, gosh, I hope someday I get to hunt with you. Um, you likewise, we, likewise. Yeah. We spend a day together in the field. I mean, you just leave that space with the mm -hmm. respect for each other, but you can get into these conversations, into these deep conversations. And, you know, like today we're, we're, we're talking about stuff that mm -hmm. we wouldn't have talked about yeah. two weeks well, ago, I, probably I two should, weeks ago, <laughs> two weeks ago. Right. And, and, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, if I'm out there hunting with you, and I, I said this before on the, the the little social media takeover I did with Project Upland, but I've said this before. If I can sit down, well, if I can walk through the woods with you all day, all right, race, whatever. If I can walk through the woods with you all day and sit at the back of the tailgate at the end of a very good hunt, to me, that's a very personal and a very intimate type of moment right like mm -hmm. you're, you're reveling in that success you're, you're you're absorbing all of this good energy right you're laughing you saw my dog act crazy you saw my dog point well you saw your dog back you saw your dog this there's there's all of these very 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 positive things and and very few people get a chance to witness and experience those things with someone else right so if I can go through all of those, that mix of emotions and all of that stuff, and I can crack on you for missing shots and all kinds, you know, just everything that we have, we should be able to care enough about somebody else to say, hey, what's bothering you today? Or, hey, what's eating? Or, hey, what is your experience like? You know, like, I, I mm -hmm. care enough. To, 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 to care about your experience in the uplands. And even let's talk about mentorship. That's what mentorship is. Right. Is, is caring, some, caring enough about someone to nurture their, um, their, their experience in the uplands. Gary cared enough about me to, to, to be upfront and say, I know you're out of place, but Thank you. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Like, that's the type yep. of connection that we need to have, not shying away from it because it either doesn't affect us or we want to run away from it. I, I would love to, to not think that stuff when I walk out of my door and, and get in my car. You know, something that my dad said to me when I was a kid and I, I, didn't, I, I understood it as a young black child was he was like, you know, you know what I what I care about the most when I leave the house every day. Uh, I say, well, what? And he was like, getting back home. That is what I care about the most. And you do whatever you got to do to get back home, to get back to my, and, and that was, and, and we were talking about a buddy of, of, of his, if I remember correctly, a buddy of his basically, um, you know, going off on a cop. And he was like, we can't do that. Like, you got to do whatever you got to do to get home. And, 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 and the most, in the safest, most legal way possible. <laughs> right. And, and it's things like that, that I would love to, to, to turn off and be like, oh, I don't have to worry about this. You know, I, you can do whatever, but that's not my reality. And at this point in time, let's just confront that 
You know, I mean, I, 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 if I'm going to, if I'm going to spend that time with you in the field and on the tailgate and stuff like that, man, how's your family? How they doing? You know, I, I just want to yep. know what life is like for folks. Good, right. bad, blue, green, black, or brown. Right. I want to, I, I ask those same questions all the time. How's your, how's your wife? How's your kids? How's your family? How are you doing? You know, all those, all of those questions. I don't, I don't. I don't see it any other way, um, mm-hmm. but I'm not in your I'm not in your shoes. I'm not in your position. I have to think because I like to see the good in people that there's more Garys out there mm-hmm. than than the other way around. Um, I think you I, know we talk about the the mentorship mm-hmm. and mentors being so crucial in in getting that next generation into the field and and growing our hunting community. Um, How do we, I, I, I'm sure there's a million people wondering the same question for all different avenues. We live in a hunting world, right? That's, that's Mm -hmm. what we're talking about here, but how do we mentor others to feel included? Everybody, everybody. Yeah. Well, I think it starts at the point of contact and I can, I, I want to answer that and I can give you my own solution to that. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, what I'm doing about it. Um, but I think it starts at the point of contact to get everybody in to me. It, it's like show someone else, someone else that looks like them, what they're doing, you know, give, give them something relevant, you know, find something that is relevant to the experience. Even if I'm not even talking about, you know, race or, or, or anything like that, let's, let's go off of that for a little bit and talk about, um, one of my experiences, right? So earlier i said that when I gotten into it, deer hunting was not my thing, right? Like I got into Mm -hmm. it and it was like, Oh, okay. Like, uh, but I don't really like sitting in a tree. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not really interested in the horror stories that I've, I've heard about people falling out of tree stands. Like (laughs) I'm not really interested in that, but, and so to me, that's not relevant. It's, it's not something that, you know, vibrates on my frequency. You know what I'm saying? Like it it just doesn't. Yeah. Everybody likes, they have their own passion. (laughs) Yeah. I get that. Yeah. And so, If I know that, I'm going to try to get people into something like ask. All right, well, this these are the different types of hunting. Let me you you and you got to do some digging, but find out what that person may very well be interested in because sometimes the first experience of going out to the woods doesn't mean or trying to get somebody out hunting into the woods that doesn't mean put them up a stand. And I'm not faulting Eric or anybody for that. I mean that we. I had the choice to go to, but you got to find something that's, that's relevant. You know, you got to find out what they've done in the past that they enjoyed that you can swing into, you know, this hunting thing. You know what I'm saying? Like it, it, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of different avenues, but I think it's an issue of relevance. You know, I know that if I want to, yeah, I'm I'm a I'm a brainy type of person, but I know that if I want to connect with somebody that's not even black, let's say they are um Hispanic, right? And there are mm-hmm. differences there. Like, well, let's let's investigate cultural influences, you know, that may be a little more familiar to to that. Mm-hmm. You know, like I there, there's Argentine dove hunting, right? So maybe I can take you dove hunting to a good place where you're going to get plenty shots. You're going to have a good time. We can relax. You see what I'm saying? Like it's kind of casual. Yep. yep. Um, well, and I'll, I'll take I'll, stuff out the air. Yeah. I, I'll tell you uh, another friend of mine here. He lives uh, in Minneapolis and Kang Yang is his name. I met him. Mm-hmm. Oh, like a year and a half ago, two years ago, something like that now. Uh, we, Mm -hmm. we hunted together and we actually filmed a show this past winter. Um, but he, he used to be an anti hunter. 
Um, interesting. His, his, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. His father was a hunter, but he was an anti-hunter for a lot of reasons. Um, mm -hmm. And he was given a dog, and the dog eventually changed him because he learned more mm -hmm. and he tried it. And now he's actually started up um, his own mentorship program to get more nice. people the opportunity to hunt. And so he opened up through an app that's called Meetup. It's that's the name of the app. Okay. It's you know there's there's yeah. a lot of apps out there but he met people where where they were with an opportunity, right? Yep. And so his um I think his nationality would be Hmong. Uh, I know mm -hmm. he has taken out several other hunters in this time, but he has taken the time to one-on-one -on -one mentor them. And mm -hmm. they felt comfortable going out with him and he got them firearm safety certified. He took them out yep. into the field. He's taken them to different places, but the value of a mentor cannot, yep. there's, there's, it's, it's one of those things where this world, oh gosh, just more mentors out there. And so I, I try my best with, you know, my role and what I've what I've come to do in this industry, but I see mm -hmm. what you have the opportunity to do, and I know what we talked before. You, Neil, your friend, to mm -hmm. me, Neil sounds like a Jackie Robinson in the hunting industry. <laughs> you know, Neil I feel is, like he, yeah. We need to we need to have a whole nother conversation. I mean, we could. <laughs> I want to know what it was like for him. But look what he's done for you, mm -hmm. for other hunters. And now mm -hmm. you're in that position too. And today we are in a place where other people, we're talking about it. We're listening. Right. I want to know your story, Darrell. I want to know what you're going through. I'd love to walk in a field with you and experience it. And I want to stay in touch and learn about other people that I know you're going to influence oh, yeah. and i know you're going to take <laughs> out there and i know you're going to give them opportunities that you never had mm -hmm. as a kid your mm -hmm. kids i mean that's ex mm -hmm. that's exciting to me it, it really is well um, it's it's a responsibility man and i have yeah yes i i'm in the process of of, of a nonprofit and, and doing to you know in, in order to do exactly what you're saying you know to to leave something lasting um for our generations so <laughs> yeah what is your nonprofit? Yeah, yeah. so um pretty soon i will have a nonprofit. just waiting on everything to finalize but it is the minority outdoor alliance um Interesting. and yeah so um after all of this stuff kind of spurred um you know within the last few weeks i really felt compelled um to to do something like to actually have something concrete to say hey look like i'm not just talking on social media i actually want to do something being a black representative in this and i and i've said this before i think part of the issue is not seeing us or any minority in the spaces that we need to be and I've I've seen I saw a trend you know over the last couple of weeks where a lot of organizations are like hey and, and you know a lot of large organizations I mean Pheasants Forever and 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 you know we're all doing something about it but what I want to do is is take my influence and my connections my my friends my you know fellow hunters that are minorities not just blacks everybody mm -hmm. and create partnerships with larger organizations. So there are minority representatives to then reach out to, you know, some of these minority communities because, and my logic was, if a white guy walks into a black neighborhood to say, hey, let's go hunting, you're not gonna be hurt, period. You're just not. <laughs> like, that's, that's not gonna happen. That's actually very like, why are, what, what in the world? Like, what are we doing here? But, <laughs> If we get someone that's familiar and says, hey, that's also an expert in 
fishing or 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 upland hunt or deer hunt you see what i'm saying and says hey yep let's go out you know and i'm representing mm-hmm. uh pheasants forever and you know maybe you know here here's a magazine or, or or here's some gear however we need to craft it to have an incentive to say let's get more people into it that's you know that's hopefully my not hopefully is going to be my contribution everybody mm-hmm. wants to do anything but i've noticed that nobody really knows what to do because there are no representatives there are no there 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 have been plenty of people that have tried 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 but it wasn't successful because it wasn't relevant you know what I'm saying? Like it, it, it just has to be relevant. And I want to, like I said, create partnerships from leaders in the minority communities that are out there hunting, that are scattered throughout the country and say, hey, look, here's Travis. Travis, let's come up with a solution. Mm-hmm. You follow me? And then yep. let's get out there and, and, and go. You know, um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the responsibility of organizations and businesses. That's where your your weight and that's where your power is going to be. So, <laughs> and, and, on an, and on an, I mean, it is. Yeah, I I fully support your mission. I would love to just continue this conversation. Um, I think on a personal level, individually. Myself, you, anybody else that's listening, it might just be that invitation, right? Mm -hmm. Because we don't experience something out of our norm without Mm -hmm. an invitation from somebody, most likely. There's not as many you, Darrell Smith, out there Mm -hmm. that says, I'm going to do this regardless of my circumstance or what's out there. You just kept on trying and you kept on trying. So Mm -hmm. I I hope there's a lot more people that, that seek that. Um, we're, you know, it's hunting. We're, we're in a space where the, the private land, you know, I mean, public Mm -hmm. land, the access to land. So if we give invitations to people and, it should be for every everybody, right? We invite anybody and everybody to go out there Absolutely. and experience and and make it and accommodate it. And right. I think you know we're, this conversation that we're having is is hopefully a conversation that a lot of other people have and or a lot of other people have. And I know personally, just being open and and opening this dialogue up, just mm-hmm. just you and I together. The last time we talked, even today. Just knowing that it's okay to talk about this stuff. It's okay. We should be talking about it. (laughs) Right. And now we are. Okay. We are. And let's, Mm -hmm. let's keep talking about it. Let's, Mm -hmm. let's be open and keep it up. Let's, let's keep this up. There are way more Gary's out there. There are way Mm -hmm. more Durrell's out there. There are way Mm -hmm. more people out there that want the good, that want to, want the equality than people that mm-hmm. don't right i i right. believe that i believe that oh, i i 100 agree with it too and there's gonna be some pushback obviously we've seen it yep we 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 you can go it is literally documented on social media there is pushback and the pushback is either is either the choice to be silent or the choice to refuse to believe that it actually goes on you know i and it can bother us or we can outweigh it. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. We can be bothered about it or we can do something about it. Well, the conversation is is powerful. One-on-one mm-hmm. conversations are powerful. Um, a lot of people might not know what to say or how to say it, but being open to conversations in every situation is for the best, mm-hmm. especially this one. I firmly believe yeah. that. We started at, you know, off at the beginning of this show and just saying, you know, the the, the power of prayer. I believe in that. You you I believe in that. that. Yeah. I I know this is one thing that my wife and I we do daily with our kids. We we pray with them and we say, Jesus, please help us love others 
the way that you love us. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I've, I have adopted that into our prayers. You know, when we are praying over our, our kids, you know, my nine month old and, and the one on the way, I pray that my kids won't foster animosity because there's that end of it, right? Like there's that end of all of this foolishness going on. And there, there's, there's the lack of understanding and sometimes the lack of love on one end of it, but then there's harboring animosity and that doesn't help either. You follow me? Like we mm-hmm. all, there, there, there's work to be done on so many different levels. You know, it, it's it has nothing to do with what folks believe in, but but believing in love. That's that's literally what it is. Everything else is on you. But we have to understand and listen to folks, pray to love other folks like Jesus loves us. And then again, release the animosity. We cannot foster that. You learn that being married. <laughs> you learn that real quick being married. <laughs> Forgiveness is powerful, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, and, oh, and saying man. sorry too. Saying sorry right. is also very right. powerful. And too. and meaning it, like not just yeah. saying it to say it. And I and I think yeah. that's the the powerful thing about what's going on. There are people that are like, hey, sorry. You know, and I and I legitimately feel it, you know, and the sorry is accompanied by change. The sorry is accompanied by action, actionable steps. You know, and that that's that's what we gotta do, man. Well, Darrell, I'm sorry that you've been <laughs> been in positions that aren't fair. I'm sorry. Well, and and you know what? Thank you. And I, I I receive that, and you and I both are going to be the catalyst of change. I can tell you that now. Well, there's a lot of us out there. I mm-hmm. I want to continue our conversation. We've been talking for a long time today. There's so much more to get into. Um, mm-hmm. Let's keep in touch. And <sighs> Neil's story. I, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot there. We we'll, ben, we'll be back. Is, we'll, that is, we'll talk that is again. another episode. Yep. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, we will continue the conversation until then. Jesus, please help us love others the way that you love us. Right? Hey, Should we go man. forward that way today? Yeah, I, th- I think we can. We can. We can let that you know be the uh, the end and a serious amen right there. Amen. We'll catch you next time on the, on uh, on the next episode of the Flesh Podcast. <laughs>